Excellent. Well, welcome to today's event. My name is Nikki Soulsby, and I will be facilitating today's webinar with Becky Robinson. And we're going to get started right now. Um, throughout today's session, we're going to be learning about key concepts in Becky's upcoming book, Reach. If you have any questions, please go ahead and leave them in the chat, and we will save some time at the end for Q&A, so don't worry. We'll get to your questions. Um, but before we get started, let me share a little bit about Becky, for those of you who may not be familiar. So Becky Robinson is the founder and CEO of Weaving Influence, a full service marketing agency that specializes in digital and integrated marketing services and public relations for book authors, for book authors, oh my gosh, <laughs> including business leaders, coaches, trainers, speakers, and thought leaders. Since launching more than nine years ago, under Becky's leadership, the firm has provided a wide range of services to help clients launch more than 150 books, enabling these authors to build their brands, acquire more business customers, and increase book sales. In April of 22, Becky is publishing her very first book with Barrett Kohler Publishers titled Reach, Create the Biggest Possible Audience for Your Message, Book, or Cause. Becky holds a MA in Intercultural Studies from Wheaton College and received a BA in English and Creative Writing from Miami University. With that, I'll hand it over to Becky and I'll be back later for some Q&A. Thank you so much, Nikki. And again, it's, it's so weird to be on this side of the webinar, um, but I'm really thrilled that all of you have chosen to invest some time with me this afternoon. And, you know, I want this session to be as interactive as possible. So I'll try to keep my eye on the chat. And if you have any questions along the way as I'm speaking, I'd be happy to go to those questions. Um, or as Nikki said, we will address some later. So I'm really thrilled to share my book with you today. And I have a few slides uh, just to help bring the key concepts to life visually. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, I just love the cover, but Reach was not my original title. And those of you who might be aspiring authors may or may not know that when you partner with a publisher, part of the process is the publisher really helping you to refine your ideas. So if you want to get a little bit meta, not only am I launching my own book, but I'm also trying to help people understand the journey of an author. Um, when I first crafted my book proposal, the title that I had was Famous to a Few. And the reason why I had landed on the title Famous to a Few is because the concept that I talk about a lot is that when we choose to bring the best of who we are to online spaces, we create the biggest possibility to reach as many people as possible and have the largest impact for our work. But what often happens is people get frustrated. They may feel like, you know, they're not reaching enough people or they're not having a big enough impact. And so what I really wanted to be able to do was inspire people to focus on the influence that they could have with the people who are around them at any given time. So I may not be famous, you know, like Barack Obama or Brene Brown, but I can be famous to those of you who chose to show up today, whose lives I may have impacted with my work. And so originally the title that I had famous to a few um, was meant to really draw people into what's possible if you choose to invest in building an online profile. As it turns out, you know, the feedback that I got from editorial was, you know, no one wants to be told that they're not going to be famous. You know, what people want instead is the ability to aspire to greatness, which I think we all want. And so I landed on the title to reach, and you'll read this in the early part of the book, when I was out running one day, and I was thinking about all of you who might someday choose to buy or read my book. And I tried to think about what it is that, that you want. And you know, having worked with authors and thought leaders over a long period of time, this is a, a repeated word that I hear when I talk to authors. You know, I want to increase my reach. Or when I talk to business owners, we want to reach more people with our products. And so I'm really, really happy with where we landed. And I feel like the title and subtitle really does bring to life what the book is about. But for a moment, I want to talk about how I define reach, because, you know, for everyone who says they want to achieve reach, you know, there might be a whole lot of different definitions. And so at the start of the hour today, I really want to help you understand when I say reach what I'm talking about. So there are two important components to reach. There's not only this component that's mentioned in the sub subtitle of creating the biggest possible audience. <laughs> um, and in this equation, I call it expanding audience. It's not only about having a bigger audience. It's not only about reaching more people. And we'll talk throughout today's broadcast or you'll read in the book about really what it takes to expand an audience over time. But the very first important part of the reach equation is this idea of expanding audience. So reach equals expanding audience. But you know, it's not really enough to just reach a bigger audience. 
So how many of you have seen a video that goes viral and for a moment, it's all anyone can talk about. Um, and then three months later, six months later, it's forgotten. You know, I think that those of us who want to show up in the world with our ideas, what we're looking for is more than just a moment of fame. We want more than our five minutes. What we want is we want to make a lasting impact with our work and ideas. So as we start out the day, I want to just make sure that we're all on the same page with what we're talking about when we talk about this idea of reach. And what we're talking about is expanding audience plus lasting impact. So if you can hang on to that definition as we go throughout the, the hour together, as you understand the definition and, and buy into the definition, it will make all the other ideas that I'm going to share um, make more sense to you, I think. So um, I want to do a quick poll. I want to get your feedback on this question. And so as it relates to this reach equ equation that I'm sharing with you today, which part of the reach equation do you spend the most time working toward? So do you spend the most of your time trying to get that bigger audience, trying to reach more and more and more people? Or do you spend more of your time really thinking about the lasting impact your message can have? Or do you think you do a good job of splitting your time and attention on both of those priorities? I'm gonna give you a moment in the chat um, to give me an answer. And it's interesting to see how these responses are coming in. Thank you for choosing to participate. If, if you have something additional that you wanna say that, that can't you know, fall into that answer. If you want to go ahead and put in the chat any kind of feedback um, on the REACH equation. Um, so I see that Denise says lasting impact, but I am on here to figure out the bigger audience. Um, Glenn says lasting impact is so key. I think about who will turn up at my funeral. Um, it looks like at least one person said expanding audience. I'm sorry, I don't can't see your name there. Oh, Sonia. Um, and Lou says it's much harder to focus on creating a lasting impact. You know, I think that one of the reasons why it's harder to focus on creating a lasting impact is that we can't always see the results of the work that we're doing in the world. And so that lasting impact is not as easy to measure. Whereas if we're talking about a bigger audience, it's easy to take a look at you know, our social media metrics, if our Instagram is growing, or if our newsletter list is growing, if visits to our websites are growing. And it's easy to quantify that bigger audience, but it's not as easy to be able to measure the lasting impact. Okay, well, let's take a look at those results. Um, what I ended up here with, and I'll have you take a look, is that about 22% of you say that you spend most of your time working toward a bigger audience. About half of you are spending most of your time working toward lasting impact. And about a third of you are working toward both. And thank you for taking the time to share. I will pop in with a few more polls throughout today's session. Um, just a couple of other comments from the chat that look really powerful. Um, Carrie is trying to improve effectiveness at both. Robin is looking for different audiences. Jackie wants lasting impact. However, finding the lasting impact audience is hard. Um, the dilemma is that expanding audience feels urgent while lasting impact is important. Uh, so thank you to all of you who are putting your comments in the chat and I'm sure that you're each going to benefit from the other's wisdom as we share this content together today. So I want to talk to you for a moment about what I call the influence gap. And uh, for those of you who have received pre-publication copies of the book and have read this, you might be familiar with the concept. Or if you've work, worked with me, you've probably heard me talk about this concept before. In the earlier days of my company, I used to use the phrase influence in congruence to describe this. I feel like influence gap is a lot more accessible. I don't know quite, quite what I had in mind when I thought that those like, like two big words back to back were the right way to explain this concept. Uh, but what I'm talking about when I talk about the influence gap is the difference between how a person might show up in their real world life and then how they show up in online spaces. And in most of my work, what I've observed is that people most of the time spend most of their energy in building their offline work and careers. So potentially they've been an academic who might have excelled in publishing academic works and articles and maybe is coming to the world with a more mainstream book. Or maybe they've had great success in the business world. Or like my brother, who I mentioned recently on a podcast, you know, he's had a military career. And so his work over 
three and a half decades has been in the trenches, you know, out around the world uh, serving people who are in his branch of the armed forces. So people who spend a lot of time and most of their time as we most often do, you know, building their reputation offline and don't invest in online presence have this gap. And also, you know, because of choosing to invest primarily in offline spaces, they are limiting the reach of their work. They're limiting the size of their audience and the impact they, they can have to the people who know them in real life. And what's really interesting is that when you choose to, to cross over and begin to tell your story or share your work, both online and offline, what you're doing is creating the possibility that your work can scale far beyond those people who know you in your real life. You know, um, and so I hope that makes sense to you. Um, and so the influence gap really describes this, the situation where you might have this real world influence that it outpaces your online influence. So I wanna take a look right now at four kind of different possibilities. And what you're gonna notice on this graphic is that there's two icons. There's a computer screen, which represents online influence. And then there's a globe, which rec uh, recognizes and reflects your real world expertise. And so I'm going to talk to you for a moment about these four different uh, possibilities for creating online influence. And I want you to be thinking about where it is that you land now. Maybe think about where you landed a decade ago and think about uh, which of these uh, uh, choices, categories, I, I forget the words I used to describe it in the book, which of these really resonates most with where you'd like to be in your life. So I'm going to start down there in the bottom right. And this is beginners. You know, I used to call this neophytes. That was kind of a big word that people weren't sure on. And then I also landed on this term beginning beginners. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean uh, that you've never done anything in your life and career. So I don't want you to think that beginners are only those people who are just starting out. But typically a beginner is, you know, if you think about an area of expertise or an area of contribution, a beginner is someone who hasn't really gotten started yet. They haven't refined the ideas that they want to share in their real world life, you know, either because they're new in their career or because they're making a job shift. So that makes them a beginner in the real world. Or um, yeah. And the other thing is that they haven't begun in any way to share any ideas online. So they might be online, they might be online for social reasons, uh, but they're not really online in a significant way to contribute value. So I call those people beginners or beginning beginners. Now, if we go up uh, above beginners, you see masters of branding. I'm not gonna spend a ton of time uh, focused on masters of branding uh, because there's a lot of chances of offending someone, but I'm gonna suffice it to say that masters of branding would be those people who uh, play a big game online, but when you really get beneath the surface, there's not anything of, of real substance there in terms of a contribution that that person's made in real life. I would guess that because you're here today, uh, that is not you. And so we're, we're just going to jump over that. Um, I want to spend a moment talking about traditional thought leaders. So traditional thought leaders are those ones that I was describing as I started to talk about the influence gap. And those are those people who, for one reason or another, have not chosen to invest in showing up in the online spaces, and they've spent most of their energy or all of their energy on their offline life. So quite often when clients come to work with me because they have a book to bring to the world, it's because they want to figure out how to close that gap between the expertise that they've so flawlessly brought to their real lives and um, bring that to online spaces in a more powerful way. Um, a phrase that I use to describe this is really helping people show up online in the same powerful ways that they show up in real life. And I want to say, because I'm going to use some examples of each of these quadrants in a moment, that there's no shame in being a traditional thought leader. If you are a traditional thought leader, you likely have achieved so much amazing work in your life. You've likely created that lasting impact. The piece of the reach equation that showing up online will help close is that idea of expanding audience. So you're already having lasting impact and you want to be able to show up online in order to be able to grow the biggest audience possible. So uh, the final uh, possibility here is to become what I call a true reach expert. And this is someone whose online presence matches their real life expertise. And because of that, they are best positioned to reach as many people as possible with their work. And this is a journey that people can be on to become a true reach expert.
So I want to take a moment and share with you some examples and stories. And this happens to be a new picture of me. Um, but I want to talk to you about 2009 when I first came online. Um, and I'm thinking in 2009, I was 38 years old. I had stepped out of the workplace uh, for nearly a decade to raise my three young children. And you know, I didn't really have a vision of the career that I could create. And now if you had asked me at the time, Becky, are you a beginner? I, like I would have probably gotten angry at you because, you know, I wanted to believe that I had value to bring to the world, which I likely did, but I also wanted to believe that I knew more than I might have thought that I knew. But in retrospect, when I came online in 2009, I truly was a beginning beginner. I hadn't necessarily created enough significant ideas to create to online spaces yet. Um, it did take me some time to really find my way in terms of the topics and value that I wanted to offer through my online presence. And, you know, in the real world, uh, while I added a ton of value to my family as I stayed at home with my kids, you know, I wasn't necessarily impacting people through any type of ideas in the world. So I'm gonna use myself now from 2009 as, as the example of a beginning beginner. You know, I hope that if you're on this call, you might recognize that I have been on a journey to refine the expertise that I can offer to the world and also to make a real world impact with the people that I serve. And so I would consider myself at this moment to not to no longer be in that category of beginning beginner. But I use myself in as, as an example here because I think that when you can have the attitude of being a beginner, uh, it really opens up a lot of beautiful possibilities for you. So, you know, when you're a beginner, it's okay to ask questions. When you're a beginner, it's okay uh, to admit that you don't know something. When you're a beginner, um, you know, you have to be patient with yourself, right? So think about, you know, a child who's learning how to ride a bike or anytime you want to learn something new, like, it, of course, you're not going to know how to do it right away. Um, so if you happen to be listening today, and as it relates to growing online presence, if it feels like you're a beginner, it's a, it's a perfectly okay place to be. And I hope that you'll leave this call with some ideas about how to move um, toward a place of reaching more people and having a bigger impact as you discover the ideas that you have that you want to share with the world. All right, so I want to talk about a traditional thought leader, and I don't think that Kim Cameron would mind in the least little bit that I'm using him as an, an example for this. Uh, Kim Cameron wrote this amazing book called Positively Energizing Leadership, and as it relates to real world impact, his career at the University of Michigan um, as a professor and a scholar and a researcher is unparalleled. You know, if you would mention Kim Cameron's name to anyone who has known him, he would tell you that he's like one of the nicest guys you will ever meet. But when I met Kim, one of the things he said is, hey, I've never done any publicity. I don't really know that it's going to be valuable for me necessarily to build an online presence, but I really do want to reach as many people as possible with my ideas. And so Kim Cameron, you can name, you know, a dozen more people like him. Um, you know, by anyone's standards, making a huge impact in the world uh, and someone I admire and I'm so glad that I've had the chance to meet. Um, just side note, check out his book. It's definitely worth reading. And the cover matches for each. So this is a perfect time to buy it. You can buy both books. They match, they coordinate because that's what matters, right? You want the covers to coordinate. All right. Um, all right. I want to talk to you about my friend, Karen Hurt. Uh, I use Karen in the book as an ex example of a true reach expert. And one of the reasons why I love Karen's story is because when I first met Karen, she was not what I would call a true reach expert. Um, instead, what Karen was, was like this highly influential career woman. She worked at Verizon Wireless. She was an executive. Uh, she worked with call centers and she found herself going into call centers uh, and answering the same questions over and over again as she was training and pouring into her, her teams. And so Karen decided one day to try an experiment. And rather than, you know, continuing to answer the same questions in the same way, she decided to start a blog. And when she started the blog, the whole idea was, you know, she was going to share these answers in a way that could get to people easier. She didn't expect that she would attract other readers beyond her Verizon circles. Uh, so when I met Karen, she was still an executive at, at Verizon. She was starting to see a lot of traction for her growing online presence. She was starting to get asked to speak. People were starting to ask her, when are you going to write a book? And so Karen very early on um, 
and I remember coaching her. I can't remember. I think she was my client at one time, but also just a friend along the way. And I began coaching her about how to grow her online influence. We did some branding for her website, all sorts of work together. Um, and Karen has grown from that place, you know, prior to publishing any books. I think the first book that she published was self-published. She went on to have a few traditionally published books, including the latest one, which is called, I think, Courageous Cultures. I don't know if you can grab that. Uh, Aubrey and put that in the chat for folks. At any rate, you know, Karen went from having a primarily real world influence on the folks that she worked with at Verizon. She ended up leaving Verizon. She ended up building this training company. And so if you were to meet Karen today, what you would see is that she has a very legitimate, thriving, successful speaking, consulting and training business. And she has this powerful online presence that reaches people with great new content every single week. And later on in this broadcast, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what I call the four reach commitments. Um, and Karen's life certainly displays all of them. Um, so I would encourage you to check out Karen's work. You'll find her and her husband business partner, David Dye, at letsgrowleaders.com. But just shout out to Karen because she did the work that it took to create an online influence that matched her real world presence. All right, so I want to pause and take another poll. And I am curious to hear about you. So as we think about the influence gap, I'm curious which of the four categories of online influence best matches you. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and launch that poll. So would you call yourself a beginner? Are you like me in 2009, really trying to figure out what you want to share in the world, trying to figure out how to grow an audience for the work? Or maybe you are a traditional thought leader. You have put a lot of time and energy into your real world career. You're really good at what you do. You have deep expertise, but you're not showing up, up online in powerful ways. Or are you a true reach expert? Someone who has created an online presence that matches your real world influence. And I'll give you a few moments to answer that poll. Um, and I'm gonna check, uh, catch up on the chat a minute. Um, Let's see. Oh, awesome. Thank you for uh, going ahead and bringing up some content about Karen Hurt. I love it. I just love seeing that. Um, so Jackie, I see your comment that you're a beginner, but I would say that you're more of a traditional thought leader if that's the case, because you have had this massively powerful career and you have a lot of value to share with others. All right, so it looks like most folks have had a chance to answer. So let's end the poll. And I will share those results with you. So it looks like about half of you, more than half of you today, call yourself a beginning beginner. And I hope that I encouraged you that it's, a, it's an okay place to be. Um, we don't have any masters of branding on this call as I expected that we would not. It looks like about a third of you would call yourselves traditional thought leaders. And only about 5% of you would call yourself true reach experts. So as we go throughout the day, I am going to give you some ideas about how you can become true reach experts, um, if that is what you aspire to. Um, and yeah, I guess that would be another great question. If you do aspire to be a true reach expert, would you go ahead and put that in the chat? Um, I want to be a true reach expert. Actually, so when I say that, I'm going to laugh at myself because I don't know if anybody ever watches church online, but quite often this one pastor that I like to listen to, he'll always say, go ahead and type that in the chat. I want to be a true reach expert. I find it so cheesy. And then I just did it. What? <laughs> all right. Thanks. I love seeing that you all want uh, to be a true reach expert. Uh, I'm glad you're here. And I hope that I can give you some guidance um, as you're on that journey. Um, I did. I see a question here from Sally, and she's wanting to know more about the master of branding category and what about it is so delicate to define. Um, I think that the thing that's delicate to define about that, and I'll go back to that graphic since we're not quite ready to move on yet. Um, the thing that's delicate to define about the master of branding is that it's really saying to someone, your online presence is superficial. There is no substance here. Um, I think in order to make an impact, you have to start with something of value. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Um, but basically a master of branding would be someone who knows how to attract followers, who knows how to create splashy content, but maybe underneath they haven't actually done the hard work um, or don't have that real world career experience or contribution to back it up. So Sally, I hope that's helpful as I try to define that a little bit more. Um, 
And uh, I see some questions coming in chat that we'll have to like circle back to later because there's a lot there. Um, and thanks to all of you who are telling me that you want to be a true reach expert. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Okay, so I want to take a moment to talk to you a little bit about the reach framework. Um, and I, I can't help I always fiddle with my computer and then I'm whatever. Okay, so I want to talk to you about being a true reach expert and this graphic is what I call the reach framework. And contained in the REACH framework are lots of possibilities in terms of investments that you can make with your time and energy and money to grow your online presence. And what I want to do is start at the center, um, because there are lots of different ways to show up online, but the most important thing to do is to find a place that you own and control online, which really means that if you want to show up online in the same powerful ways that you show up in real life, you have to start by having a home for your online presence. And typically that's going to be either your personal brand website or your business website. And this graphic has that house at the center uh, because the, your website is the place that helps people to very quickly and carefully and clearly connect with the value that you have to offer the world. So if you wanna think about your website as the center of your online presence, then your online presence has to adequately represent your real world expertise, your best ideas, your best thinking. And it has to be easy for people to see the story of your online contribution and ideas on your website. So one of the ways to try to check to see how well you're doing is to think about, you know, if, if your real life people showed up on your website, are they seeing the same person that they see in real life? and vice versa. So do the people who know you in real life, would they be, be able to clearly articulate the value that you offer and does it match what your website is portraying? So next to the website is uh, a little icon that looks like an envelope and that represents your email marketing. And at this point in time, one of the most effective ways we have to reach our audiences online is through email. And so the big goal that we have is we want to grow an online presence is to get people's permission to stay in touch with them long term. And so we do that through email marketing. Uh, the other thing that's at the center of the REACH framework is content marketing. So content is the vehicle for the value that you bring to the world. And so as we think about this idea of showing up online in the same powerful ways that we show up in real life, there has to be some substance to it. That's what differentiates a true reach expert from a master of branding. And so if you have content of value, the idea is that you need to be sharing it in ways that attract the audience that you want to attract. So as the reach framework has the center, the center is the most important part. So if you have limited time or money, um, the thing that you want to do is spend your limited time and money first on building a website, growing an email list, and showing up with content in the world. Once you get beyond those, uh, social media is a place where we can find and form relationships. And so as kind of the second tier of the REACH framework, uh, you really want to think about showing up on social media channels as a way to reach an expanding audience. And um, once you find them, what you want to do is you want to get them back to your website, uh, you want to get them back to your email list, um, and you want to be able to share content of value with them over time. Now, on the outside of the REACH framework are other approaches that you can try to reach more people with your messages. But one thing I want to really focus on is that you really have to get the center pieces strong because you don't want to create a lot of interest in these outside circles and then lose touch with people. So I talked at the top of the hour a little bit about what it's like when you create a viral video and you're famous for a moment and then people forget about you. Having a website and an email list and staying in touch with people long term ensures your memorability. And so if you want to make an investment in print or digital or broadcast media, or if you want to do virtual and live events to reach people or spend money on advertising, what you want to use all of those initiatives or tactics to do is to help people stay more closely connected to you over time so that you can have the impact that you want to have with them. Um, so any of those should really drive people back to the core of your online presence where they can clearly see the value that you can bring. Um, so you want to be able to use those to bring people back to your website, to your email list, and to the valuable content that you're creating in the world. So in the book, I definitely go into greater detail about this. But the idea is if you're thinking about your online presence and you're wanting to move from being a beginning beginner to a true reach expert, you really start at the center of the reach framework and you make an investment in your website, in your email list, in your content. Um, and then from there, you 
can try additional tactics as a way to find and form relationships and expand your audience. Okay, so I want to spend uh, some more time before we go to Q and A, um, talking about the four reach commitments because the four reach commitments are really at the heart of the book. Uh, now, another meta moment, you know, at the beginning of the call, I talked about um, how having a publisher helped me land on a better title for my book that would more. Uh, resonate with my audiences. This graphic also represents a place where the editorial team had a big, big impact. Um, an earlier version of this was the four reach factors. And, you know, I thought that was pretty good. You know, from all the stories and the research that I did for the book, I landed on these four factors, which you need to invest in in order to reach a bigger audience and have a lasting impact. And Neil Mallet, my editor, came back and he said, I really think we need a stronger word here, Becky. And he offered a few. And the one that I loved was commitments, because, of course, Course. you know, when I'm talking about this choice that we can each make to show up online in the same powerful ways that we show up in real life, you know, it's a choice, but it's also a commitment. And when I shared uh, the story of Karen Hurt and how she went from, you know, being a traditional thought leader, having a great impact at Verizon, she made a choice to invest in building an online presence. And as a part of that choice, she made these very important commitments, which have allowed her to continue to grow her audience and impact over time. So let's dive into these four commitments. The first one that you have to start with is value. And so at the center of the REACH framework, I spoke about the fact that, you know, content is the vehicle for the value that you bring to the world. So if you want to be a true REACH expert, you really start with some area of expertise where you can contribute value. And you begin with your audience in mind. So not every audience finds value in the same content. And along the way, you'll discover the audience uh, that most needs the content that you are creating. Um, but no matter your topic area, what you need to start with is value. That's uh, what will make you memorable. That will, is what will help people connect to you. And not only do you want to start with value, but you also want to add to that value the idea of generosity. Because most of us, in order to build a presence online, we have to give away a lot. We give away our content. We give away our best thoughts and ideas. And as we do that, uh, we build connections with people. Um, you know, we give away our time. And as we do that, we build connections with people. Uh, we give away um, our, yeah, I, our ideas, our energy, our thoughts. Um, so you take value and you add to that value generosity. And you know, oftentimes showing up in online spaces is, is a lot about what you have to give. Um, but I think that it gets turned on its head sometimes when um, instead people think it's about you know, what you get. Um, and so you know, we don't have to, a lot of time to go into that today. But as, as you read the book, what you'll notice is that I tell the stories in every single case, people are showing up uh, through their online presence with generosity. Now, here's another one, consistency. Um, and this is one that's often challenging for people. Um, when I spoke about Karen Hurt, one of the amazing things about Karen is in the early days of growing Let's Grow Leader, she blogged every single day. You know, one of the most consistent thought leaders, true reach experts, I know Dan Rockwell, Dan does blog every single day to this day, he's done it for an entire decade. Well, how is Dan Rockwell reaching a large audience? Well, he shows up with value in a generous way, consistently, and not only that, over a long period of time, longevity. So when we when we think about longevity, um, there were some other words that we th threw around in the book before we landed on longevity. We threw around the word endurance. We threw around the word perseverance. Um, I think that where people get tripped up as they want to grow a bigger audience and where people get tripped up when they want to have lasting impact is they think it can happen overnight. You know, you think you could start a podcast and do it a dozen episodes, or you can start a blog for a few months, and suddenly you're going to create this massive audience for your work. It does not work that way. For all the people that I've served over the past decade, uh, the ones who have the biggest impact over time are the ones who stick around um, and the ones who consistently show up. Uh, Whitney Johnson is a thought leader, uh, a true reach expert who wrote the foreword to my book. And I met Whitney back in 2011 um, as she was preparing to launch her first book, uh, Dare Dream Do, in 2012. And at the time, you know, Whitney had had, had, had a blog. She was kind of 
dipping her toes in the water as it relates to um, Twitter and Facebook and other social media channels. She did have a website. I remember in those early days, I actually worked on the website with her um, as she launched a new brand site in 2012. Um, for those of you who don't know Whitney, Whitney is now uh, named on the Thinkers 50 as the eighth uh, most influential thought leader in the world. And when I think about Whitney, the way that she has grown that strong online presence is through all these four commitments that I'm highlighting today. She showed up with tremendous value. You know, since the first book, she's published three more. Um, she showed up with consistently through her weekly newsletter, now through weekly LinkedIn Lives, um, through her podcast, not sure the frequency on that. And she's done this over 10, 11, 12 years that I've known her. And, you know, obviously, because she's showing up with so much value all the time, that's an expression of her generosity. So, you know, any thought leader example that I could come up with today, every single one of them is making these four commitments um, and, and none of them are mag magical. They're all about hard work, you know? It's hard work to add value to online spaces. You know, it can be hard work to give it away. You know, it's hard to create consistency and it's hard to stick around for a long time. Um, but when you make that choice and commitment, you are creating the biggest possible impact for your work. So I wanna pause again and uh, try another poll. And let's hear about your take on the four commitments. So of these four commitments, value, generosity, consistency, and longevity, which of these four is the most challenging for you right now? And I know I'm cheating. I didn't give you a chance to say more than one. Um, but that's just the way it goes today. You have to make a choice. Which of these is the most challenging for you? I see there's a ton of chat. I have not um, really been paying attention uh, to the chat. So if there's anything that I need to see when we go to Q&A, Nikki, hopefully you can flag that for me. Um, and it looks like a few people um, are commenting about the different commitments that are challenging. Um, Carrie, you asked the question, is, uh, does a blog count or does it need to be a website? It depends upon if you own the blogging space or if someone else does. Um, a blog counts for sure if you own the domain. So let me take a look. It looks like most of you uh, have answered. So let me end that poll. And before I share the results with you, I'm going to tell you that these results do not <laughs> surprise me in the least little bit. These results are you know, pretty much on point with what I might have expected. Um, the most challenging for people, 62% of you uh, said that consistency is, is tricky. And what I want to just spend a moment on, um, and this does come from the book, is the difference between uh, consistency of action and consistency of presence. And I'm hoping that might give you a little bit of hope. So I use Dan Rockwell as an example, and he's blogged every day for a decade. And most of us cannot achieve that level of consistency. When I was interviewing Dan for the book, I asked him how he did that. He told me that his dad was a dairy farmer. And you know what dairy farmers do? They have to milk the cows day and night. That consistency is forced by their jobs. Most of us don't have you know, any kind of commitment to creating content that is gonna force that kind of consistency upon us. Um, but it makes sense that Dan would kind of have that inside track into how to create it. You know, if you can't create consistency of action, what you want to do instead is create consistency of presence. And for those of you who might have gotten some early signed copies of my book, one of the things I wrote on a lot of them was keep showing up. That's like the call to consistency. Keep showing up. It doesn't matter that you show up, you know, in the same way every time, but stay stay present. Stay present in your offline contribution to people. Stay present in your online contribution to people. And maybe that uh, idea that you just need to keep showing up will take some of the pressure off the need for consistency. So for longevity, the good news is, you know, we all have another chance to try again. So if you want to keep showing up over time just start showing up again. And if you create that consistency over time, you'll create the longevity that you need. So I hope that's helpful. Um, and so as we, as we wrap up uh, the more formal part of the presentation, I wanna show you this graphic, which actually did, did not make it into the final book, um, but it brings together these ideas. So if you have consistency in content, you start with content of value, sorry about that. You start with content of value, you create consistency in content, you create longevity of your presence and you add to that 
generosity, uh, the end result should be that you will increase your reach over time. Because if you stay online in spaces over time, you have this opportunity to reach new people over time. If you show up in a consistent way, every time you show up with something of value, it's a chance to reach new people with your content. If you show up with generosity, it's a way to be memorable to people and have that lasting impact that sticks with them. So I hope that you'll keep this in mind that you start with the content that's a value, you add consistency, longevity, and generosity, and then what happens is that you increase your reach over time. But just don't neglect this idea of increasing your reach over time. It is so easy to give up too soon. Um, and so you want to think about that as I, I, I'm going to share a story to wrap up. Some of you have maybe heard this story before. Um, I know my friend Glenn has because I just shared it last week um, at the end of our workshop. Um, but for those of you who haven't heard this story before, this is my home. Um, and this is my home when it was built about 30 plus years ago by a couple named Mike and Kathy Sitarski. And I happen to live in kind of a rural area. And my house is on a fairly busy and well-traveled road. But it's about a uh, tenth of a mile or more off the road. So you can see the driveway that winds up the road. And when Mike and Kathy bought the house, one of the things they quickly figured out is that when they would gather by that little barn in the back corner over here for bonfires at night with their kids, what would happen is they could see the cars going by. It was noisy, there were lights. And they realized very quickly that what they wanted was not quite what they had. What they wanted was a very peaceful and private home and retreat. And so uh, they made this decision that they would plant some trees. And at the time, their budget to plant trees was not such that they could go, go and buy full grown trees. Um, instead, they bought saplings. They were tiny and 500 of them fit in a wheelbarrow. And Mike and Kathy and their three young kids painstakingly planted trees around the property. And I met uh, Mike's son at a funeral not long ago. He was back in the area. And he said, oh, it wasn't 500. It was 800 trees. And we didn't plant them once. We had to plant and replant them uh, because my dad wanted to get them in the best spots. And then some died and we had to plant more. I hope you're getting the idea that planting and cultivating these trees was a lot of work. But the reason that they did it is because they wanted to create a home where they could have privacy and peace, and they could see a vision of the future that wasn't there yet, but they knew it was their hard work that would bring it about. And so I want to share another picture with you. This is uh, an aerial view, thank you Google Maps, of the property today. As you can see, it looks much different. And the reason it looks different is because the Sitarsky family had a vision of a future uh, that would require a lot of hard work, that would require a lot of dirt and tears and sweat <laughs> along the way. Um, but they knew that, that if they made that investment that they could build something beautiful. And so those of us who work to become true reach experts, to make sure that we can contribute in powerful ways to online audiences to reach a bigger audience over time. We are like those people who would choose to plant 500 trees and wait for them to grow. And you know, it may be some trees never grow. Uh, you know, some of them die. Um, and it's like that in our efforts as well. We don't know as we show up in online spaces to share value, um, the impact that we will have. And we may never live to see and enjoy the fruit of the work that we invest in the world. Um, but we do it because we want to make a difference ultimately. So I wanna encourage you, uh, we are gonna go to Q&A and, and Nikki's gonna come back, but I hope that you will uh, think about this image, this picture, um, and that it will inspire you to make an investment to show up online in powerful ways so that you can create that impact for your ideas over time. So I believe, Nikki, that you are going to come back. I know there's a ton in the chat. I haven't had a chance to, to keep looking. Um, but where do we want to start on questions, Nick? We have some great questions. So the first one, Becky, is um, it's from Jennifer. And she wants to know, regarding the email list, how much contact is, is the appropriate amount without being too much? Yeah, Jennifer, that is a really great question. And I'm actually gonna take it in a completely different direction. <laughs> Surprise. All right, so you, know, you could ask how much is too much, but what I would ask instead is, what can you reasonably sustain over time? Because I think the challenge that some of us have when we decide to show up on online spaces is that we bite off way more than we can chew. And so what I would say, Jennifer, is start with, you know, what are you willing to create? How frequently can you consistently create content? Um, and I would start with 
sometimes what might seem less than what you can do in order to ensure that you can create that consistency and longevity because we all have a limited amount of time and energy and money and you know building an online presence takes all three and so rather than saying like how am i going to wear out my audience what i would want to say first is you know how consistently can i show up now that said um there are all different types of kind of uh people in the world and some might get overwhelmed by a weekly newsletter and some might get overwhelmed by a monthly newsletter and certainly most of us would get overwhelmed by a daily newsletter but if you're showing up with value, then the people who want the content that you're creating are going to open the emails as they're able um, and the rest will unsubscribe and that's okay too. So Jennifer, I hope that helps. Um, you know, I try to think about at times some of the challenges I might face with my children, for example. And if I can find a thought leader who's putting out content that addresses some of the issues I'm having with my kids, then you better believe when their email comes in, I'm opening it. Um, and so sometimes if you can think about who is it that you're creating content for, you know, what do they need? Um, and then we have to get out of our own ways. You know, we, we assume people don't want our emails. Well, guess what? Some people do. They sign up and they read and they respond. And those are the people that you're creating the content for. I love that. I, I find that Becky's advice apply. Becky's given me the same advice because I asked the same question like two weeks ago. Um, and so she's being consistent and she gave me tremendous value, which was very generous of her. <laughs> um, and it, it's, it's been working. <laughs> Uh, we have another question from Lauren, who says, I spend so much time emptying my inbox, and I hate to think of myself becoming a spammer. What distinguishes spam emails from valued content? Well, and I think I already answered that. It, it is in the uh, assessment of the recipient of the email. So anyone can take the same email and look at it and call it spam. But if that's the email that you're wanting, that you perceive to be of value to you, then um, then that's, that's obviously not going to be spam. Now, that said, um, you want to be sure that if you're sending email, it is to a permission-based list. And in the book, I talk about the importance of making sure that people opt into your list. You never want to take a list of people um, and send email to them if they haven't explicitly given you permission to do so. And that's one way to ensure that you're not going to be seen as a spammer. Make sure it's easy for people to unsubscribe. You know, that's the law, actually. And I'm not going to advise on the law, uh, but I hope that helps. Excellent. Um, I have a question. So for someone who's getting started and doesn't have a big budget, what would you say are the most one, two, or maybe three things that I could start doing today that would make a big difference? Well, if you haven't gotten started at all, I think the first investment is in, you know, buying a domain and creating a website that helps people see the value that you offer to the world. And there's a wide range of budget you know, for people in building a website. Maybe you need to build your own or maybe you can hire someone to do it for you, but that would be the first thing. Um, and you know, beyond that, I, I, I think it depends upon what your goals are. So I really wouldn't wanna give a blanket answer of this is what each person should do. It's gonna be different depending on what you're trying to achieve. I hope that helps. It does. <laughs> it definitely does. We have a question from Daryl who wants to know how you came up with the idea for the QR code. Oh, I love that question. So um, for those of you who, uh, this is not actually the book that has it in it. Dang. Do you have your book handy, Nikki? Mine's like across the room. So at the end of every single chapter, Nikki, do you want to show those who may not have seen the book yet? Um, what we have done is we have included a QR code. So anyone who buys the book has the opportunity to scan that QR code. Or if you're listening to the audio book, I actually speak out that URL. And what we've done is we've built a course. It would probably take 10 hours or more to finish the course where I go a bit deeper on every single topic that's in the book. Now, uh, is it Daryl who asked the question? The resources mm -hmm. aren't quite done yet. Our goal is to get them done by April 1st and certainly by launch date. Uh, but the idea is we wanted to make it easy for people to access learning beyond the book. So actually, when you buy the book, you're accessing this tremendous learning beyond the book. How did I get the idea? Well, I've been marketing books forever, you know, 10 years. And I always coach our authors to find a way to not only just have people read your book, but then stay connected to you. So here's another meta lesson of this book launch. When people use the QR code, they're going to go to a landing page. Guess what they're going to give me? 
their email address. So I'm going to have a way to stay in touch with the people who have bought and read my book. Um, which will help me to have that impact that I want to have over time. And hopefully that will be growing my audience as well. But the generosity pieces, we're giving away, you know, tons of value and free content, including all the interviews that I did when I wrote the book. So many of them became podcast episodes. Some of them didn't. Um, and, you know, as a result, um, you know, we're providing that to everyone who buys the book which I'm super excited about. So Daryl, thank you for giving me that chance to do like a little sales pitch. Um, yeah, I hope that helps. Yeah, I think that the QR code is an incredible addition to the book. I, I've read a couple books recently where they linked to additional resources beyond the actual content of the book and I found it incredibly valuable. So I'm really excited to get through Becky's book and see what other fun things are coming. Yes, in the course, you know, there's, there's more to come. Every time we open up the course, I'm like, oh, well, we could add this resource. We could add, we didn't add this conversation. So um, I'm so thrilled by the engagement in the chat today, folks. Uh, I love it. Uh, Lauren wants to know the best ideas for expanding your email list. And, um, you know, I think events are a really powerful way to grow an email list. I think one of the challenges with using events to grow an email list is that you have to um, have an audience, whether that's like out on social media or um, if it's connecting into someone else's network. But if you can make it very clear that when someone signs up to attend your event, they're also signing up to hear from you in an ongoing way. I think events are probably the fastest way. Um, we also and I'm not sure if it's in the book or not, it probably is. We talk a lot about what we call a lead magnet. So a lead magnet is any content that you might give away for free that shares the value of your work. Um, and then as people download that resource, they're giving you their email address to get it, like with the course. Um, I mentioned, you know, using resources as a parent. Uh, there's a podcast that I listen to for parents. And at the end of every podcast, the host says, you know, this podcast is sponsored by and she names her free resource, and then she sends people off to get it. And so she's using the podcast as a means of driving people to this free resource. And every single podcast episode, she's talking about the resource. Um, so that those are a few ideas for you, Lauren. I hope that helps. We have one more question. This is from Joe. Joe wants to know, is there an actual journey from beginners to reach experts? And, or are they separate dimensions? Yeah, it's a good question. So there's not really anything in the book about the steps that you might take um, to, follow, to follow to get from a beginner to a true reach expert. The truth is you're not necessarily going to have to pass through all of those four um, categories in order to get to true reach expert. Um, and what you want to do is you want to build your online life at the same time that you're doing things offline. So whatever it is that you're doing in your offline life, the ideas that you're creating, the expertise that you're sharing, the contribution that you're making, what you want to do is you want to do them both at the same time. And as you do both at the same time, you're going to jump from being a beginning beginner over to being a true reach expert. Um, and I don't know that there's any magical moment that that happens. Um, but I do, um, think that over time, as you grow your expertise, then you'll find yourself really having jumped from one category to the other. And, and you're not going to need to go to the other categories because you don't need to become a traditional thought leader first and go do a lot of work offline and then come show up online. You need to do them both at once. But yeah, that's not covered in the book. So maybe that's an article waiting to be written. So um, I think as we wrap up today, I, I saw a question come in. I'm going to ask answer it really fast. Uh, Lauren, the question is generosity. How effective are book giveaways? Um, you know, I think different authors find book giveaways to be uh, useful in different ways. I have heard that for fiction authors, book giveaways are not very useful. Um, for nonfiction authors, um, Mark Miller is a client of mine. He believes that in order to sell more books, you have to give away more books. And he makes it a goal to give away 10% of the books he hopes to sell. Now, I've probably already given away about 400 pre-publication topics of um, topics, pre-publication copies of my book. Um, if you were seeing the other side of the room, it's where I've been packaging them all up. Um, 
and I want to sell more than 4,000. So I probably need to give away more books on my journey to selling 10,000 copies in the first year, as I hope to. Um, I do think that books are seeds. The more you get out, uh, the more people you'll reach with your ideas, the more you will sell. So for nonfiction, I highly, highly, highly recommend giving away as many books as possible. Um, so as we wrap up today, uh, I think that Nikki has some actions you can take. I do. I have some next steps for you guys. So the first thing you can do next is to pre-order Becky's book. It's available at Barnes and Noble, um, at bookshop.org and on Amazon. And if you're interested in making a bulk purchase of that order, uh, there's, there's a special offer listed on Becky's website. So you can go to beckyrobinson.com slash book. And Thirdly, you can join us for Becky's virtual launch party, which is going to happen really soon, 319, so March 19th. Nope, it's April, April 19th. That's oh. the pub date of the book. My bad. April no worries. <laughs> no at worries. 11 a.m., mm -hmm. uh, which is Eastern time. And um, I, I bet Aubrey will throw the, the link to... To join yeah, us. and a, a side note about the virtual launch party, it's going to be a blast. I have a special guest, Tan May Vora, who's someone I met online at the very beginning of my journey, and he's incredible. We're going to hear about how he's incorporated the four commitments to grow his business. We also have some copies of a book. Um, in the appendix of my book, I feature uh, the book Every Penguin in the World by Charles Bergman. We have some free copies of that book that we're going to give away at the virtual launch party. We also are going to have free Starbucks drinks that we're going to email to people who register and to you know to people who show up and I'm actually going to go to Starbucks before the event so I have my drink with me at the party because it's a party so I hope that people will join the party I also one more note so for anyone who pre-orders the book as a result of this uh, webinar today we are going to have some free uh, codes available on Google Books for the audiobook version which I actually read myself um, and Whitney Johnson actually read the foreword so for those of you who might enjoy audiobooks we're asking you to pre-order the print book but if you email us, you know, over the next week or so as you've uh, participated in this webinar or watched the recording. Once we have them available, we'll send you a free audio book code as a thank you for pre-ordering the book. But before we go, I just want to take a moment to shout out Nikki. Nikki, thank you so much for hosting the event today. I want to make sure everybody knows about your book, Lies I Told Myself and Other Truths, How to Squash the Mental Monsters and Live Your Dreams. And what I love about this book is that Nikki shares a lot of her journey, um, and she shares it in a real authentic way that connects with her readers powerfully. I also want to encourage you to sign up for Nikki's newsletter. She's writing every week, um, and you can have the chance to stay in touch with her and learn from her. Um, so as we wrap up today, I, I want to thank you for taking the time to invest with me today. And I want to remind you that when you choose to show up in powerful ways through your online presence, you will choose to create the biggest possible impact for your work over time. So I hope that you will choose to make those four commitments. And as you journey that you'll have patience and joy um, and endurance as you continue to contribute in online spaces. Thanks everyone.